Content on Organics channel. We'll be creating videos on company and industry updates, answering people's questions. So don't be afraid to send us any questions if you have any, and introducing members of the team. So who better to join us than co-founder and president, Michael Townsend. Michael, how are you doing today? I'm fantastic, Michael. How about yourself? Doing pretty well, doing pretty well. Looks like you're enjoying a nice sunny day. Let's dive right. into you a little bit, man. So tell me about your past. What got you interested in business? And just, just kind of give us an overview of you. Sure. Well, I've been doing it for a long time. I think it's 30 years, give or take a few months right now. Uh, I started in 1990, 91. I was introduced to a, to a company, which was initially a shell company called CEL Industries. Mm -hmm. And I, I had some, some money. I bought the stock, bought it at 15 cents, bought it at 20, 25. And then I remember buying it probably at 30 and got to 40 cents. And I said to my friend that was uh, working for the company, I said, maybe I should sell a little here. And he said, well, sell it to who? You're the only buyer. So that was my, that, <laughs> that was my first lesson in the penny stock business. Yeah. And um, uh, we, we had a lot of success with that company. We, uh, it was ended up having a, uh, the CEO was a Polish gentleman by the name of Stan Zari. And uh, the wall had just come down in 89 and he was, he was very excited to find a project in Eastern Europe, specifically Poland, that uh, that we could finance and effectively take public on the TSX Venture Exchange, which was called the VSE back then. And uh, we uh, we ended up uh, deciding on going with pizza restaurants, and we were able to uh, we were able to build 15 pizza restaurants in Poland. We raised about 15 million dollars back there uh, in in the 90s, the early 90s. And uh, that, uh, that's probably like $30 million in today's money. So uh, by all accounts, a successful raise, uh, stock went to $2 a share. Uh, I was replaced, I was on the board when I was 24 years old, I was on the board in 92, and I was replaced by the incoming institutional uh, managers. They had put some people on the board and replaced me. So I got out at the top and, and uh, uh, got bit by the bug and uh, have never looked back since. Gotcha, all right, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. People's first lessons in entrepreneurship and investing and stuff is usually a little bit more of a harsh one as you're trying to trying to maneuver your way through the world. But it's it's good you caught that spark and you stuck with it. That's that's how things succeed is by sticking with them. Interesting though, the pizza business is definitely a interesting one to raise fifteen million dollars with. That's that's very impressive. Also, sitting yeah. on the board at twenty four years old, that that's a pretty good accomplishment too. Absolutely. So then, what happened from there? Well, uh, the mining business was all the rage post that. So I think 94, 95, we had the diamond fields discovery, uh, which they were looking for diamonds in Africa and ended up finding nickel and uh, cobalt in uh, Labrador. Mm -hmm. And uh, I still uh, sit in the office beside me, Greg Seaton, who was on the board of diamond fields. And that was a, you know, they sold it to Inco for four and a half billion dollars. So that was a massive success. And then, uh, and then you also had Diamet, which was Chuck, Chuck Fipke's diamond discovery in the Northwest Territories. So the whole Northwest Territories got staked. And another one of my partners in the office, he, he, he worked for Canamera Geological at the time and they staked, they threw, they threw, they threw the staking posts out of the helicopter. They, they bought all the lumber in the, in the lumber yard. They rented all the helicopters and they staked the entire Northwest Territories. So that was exciting. Um, stocks were flying, you know, nothing like a, like a staking rush. So that was probably 90, you know, 95, 96 and 97. Uh, and then, of course, you know, then we had the big Briex disaster in uh, in 97 that blew up in about March of 97. And that was kind of the end of the mining market. So from there, we were lucky enough to uh, parlay our skills into doing uh, doing software and dot com deals. So it was the era of the dot com deal. So in 98, we got behind our first dot com deal. And uh, that was called Siege Soft, and it was like a privacy browser. So you could search surf the Internet without uh, them tracking you. We raised three or $4 million with Canaccord at 30 cents a share stock went to three bucks. Wow. Um, you know, and then of course, then the, then the whole dot com thing blew up in, you know, March of 2000 and then back into mining and mining took off again. And see, you know, gold broke through 330 an ounce and it ripped to 900 and everything was getting financed. It was fun. Then the, we did a, uh, we did a potash deal, which was really good. We raised 25 million for a company called Raytech. We had a, potash uh, discovery in Saskatchewan. So that was exciting, you know, and then, uh, and then of course the, 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 unfortunately the mining market kind of ended in about 2000, late 2011, 12, and things got pretty quiet for me. I was, uh, I had bought my first house down in the United States or I bought a, a lot down in the United States in La Quinta, which is where I live now. And uh, so we built, we just built houses there. So I've built now four houses in La Quinta and that kind of kept me busy through the slow period. Uh, I want to say like 2012 to 15, 16, 
And then, uh, and then I got a call from Vancouver and sometime in mid 15 and someone said, uh, Oh, you know, this guy's going to get a marijuana license. He's going to get a license to, uh, to grow and, um, uh, marijuana in British Columbia. So that was my first foray back into the business after th probably three years out or two and a half years out. And we took a company called true leaf public IPO and, um, you know, it was early days in the weed business. So, yeah. you know, it was kind of a 10, 20 cent stock. It wasn't, it wasn't a barn burner. Um, but then we did have a barn burner. I got behind a company called Patriot One Technologies. I got a call from Cal, who was my partner on the, on the potash deal that we'd had a lot of success on. And, and I had been instrumental in helping raise that 25 million. So he called me and said, I've got this, this, this uh, it's a concealed weapons detection technology and uh, it was coming out of the University, uh, you know, University of Ottawa and uh, Ontario. And um, we ended up, you know, I helped form the board. We, we put Martin Cronin on as the CEO. Uh, and we ended up, you know, first of all, it was just, it was tough days back then. So we did our first financing at 15 cents. I think we raised maybe 3 million at 15 cents. Then we did six and a half million at 65 cents. And then we did 12 million at $1.20. Then we did 20 million at $2. Wow. And then we did 47 million at two and a half dollars a share. So it was, a, it was very successful, um, you know, traded, it, you know, unfortunately it was right around the time in Las Vegas where there were some, some mass shootings and, uh, yeah. and so our stocks started trading like 10 million shares a day and, and the hedge funds were just throwing money at us. So that's really what grub staked me for, um, for creating Altus capital and, and, and the sort of the businesses that we're in now. And, um, yeah, so, uh, that, huh. that was that was that was that and then and then i guess you're gonna ask me about hemp town next but i'll let you do some yeah speaking. yeah <laughs> wow okay so yeah you've you've had a lot of different businesses that you've been involved in here and it seems like you're, you're the man to go to when it comes to raising money for sure you said like over 180 million dollars raised over the past 10 years even that's that's wild man congratulations you have Thank to get you we'll have to dive into some of your, your skills later on but for now just tell me yeah tell me the hemp town story dude how did how did this actually come to be Right. So um, I, again, we, we often in, in, in Vancouver, we start companies as shells. We start, and, and now it's a raging uh, thing down in the United States here, uh, SPACs, they call them down here. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, a friend and I uh, started a shell and, uh, and then we decided we want to get in on the CBD craze. That was really, uh, I live at a golf course in, down here and everyone was CBD guys were selling CBD out of the trunk of their golf carts. Yeah. And so we decided we got to get in on this. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, so we were going to do a, a beverage and uh, we called our company uh, Entourage FX. And so when we were looking for inputs for our beverage, uh, we, we had thought it would naturally, we had to get the CBD from the cannabis plant. And then it became evident to us probably in about September, October of 2018 that, uh, that you could actually get CBD from, from uh, the hemp plant mm -hmm. and a lot more CBD in the hemp plant. So more economic, higher grade uh, for the mining guys. Um, so, and then it became evident that, that, that hemp was going to become federally legal in the United States. And that was that time when all the, all the marijuana guys were afraid, afraid to cross the, cross the Canadian U.S. border because uh, guys were getting turned back and getting banned, banned for life if they uh, had said that they're in the marijuana business or the cannabis industry. So we said, this thing's going to be federally legal by, they said, December 2018. So we said, what, a, what an opportunity. So then I met a guy in November named Rod Wolterman, um, who had just had a very successful 2018 harvest. And he had about, he, he estimated about $7 million worth of hemp in the barn. It's, it's just a massive amount, very impressive looking. So we got a lot of video and of that. And I mean, raising money for hemp town was very easy when, when, uh, everyone else was saying, we're going to do this and we're going to plant this and we're going to build this. And this guy had already, already harvested around a hundred thousand pounds. Wow. So, uh, very exciting. Um, he was reasonable to deal with in his expectations uh, of how much money he, he, you know, what percentage of the company he would give up. He ended up giving up about 30% of the company for a, a $10 million raise. It, it turned out we ended up raising about, well, we raised about 37 million Canadian dollars for him. And uh, we went heavy into hemp. Um, we planted 500 acres in Oregon, 500 acres in Colorado and 500 acres in Kentucky. Um, unfortunately, we weren't the only ones that had that idea of uh, having to, you know, wanting to plant a lot of hemp because we were selling it for $56 a pound in 2019 when we monetized his 18 crop. And then in 2020, our, our 2019 crop, um, the compression markets everyone was planting, we, it was as low as probably seven, eight, nine dollars a pound. So wow. um, we've sort of 
pivoted away now from from the cultivation sector and uh, we're, we're more focused on the consumer packaged goods. We, we bought a company called Kirkman, which was a 70 year old uh, nutraceutical manufacturing company in Portland, Oregon. Um, they have about 400 different SKUs. Uh, they're FDA certified, they're a CGMP certified. And, and so we, we were lucky with some of that money instead of spending it all on the farm, we, we bought this business called Kirkman. And, and then we hired a guy named Eric Grippentrog to be the CEO mm -hmm. and he's ex um, Kellogg Corporation. And he was 27 years with Kellogg putting cereal uh, on the shelf. So he knows all about manufacturing and distribution and, and all the things you need to have a successful consumer packaged goods business. So that's, that's kind of where we are now. We can obviously dive deeper. Well, we, we'll, we want to do another video where we dive deeper into the company itself, but why don't you cap off this one by just telling us what, what your role looks like as president for the company? Well, uh, we're, it's exciting times for us now because we're, uh, we're in that marketing phase. So um, uh, actually here where I am in Newport Beach is kind of our, it's kind of our center for, for marketing. We're, 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 we're you know, using it as sort of a guerrilla marketing campaign where we've hired, we have a lot of influencers on Instagram. Uh, we've just hired a number of Instagram, uh, sorry, uh, TikTok influencers. We're doing a lot of video and, and, you know, it's kind of the fun phase of the business. Um, uh, our, our, tr our traffic on our website's gone way up. We had record sales uh, last month um, on online. Most of our business was wholesale before we did, uh, you know, our revenues are kind of like 11 million a year. Um, and uh, that was all wholesale business to business B2B. Mm -hmm. So now we're moving into retail and the margins are much higher. Um, so, but you do have to market and uh, some, sometimes guys, you know, are, are it's marketing is a, is a tough nut sometimes to, to uh, swallow because uh, you know, you don't, you don't see immediate factor. You can't yeah. you know when you buy something like a forklift, you, you know, it's going to lift a pallet with marketing. It's a little different. So, uh, but we've managed to convince management. And of course I'm a big part of management to that investing in marketing and, and, uh, and the type of guerrilla marketing that we're doing with influencers and Instagram. And that is, is really the way to go. It's a little hard to market our, our products on, uh, uh, on the typical platforms like, uh, uh, Google or Facebook, they, they, even though hemp is federally legal, they still shy away from it. Sure. So you have to get a little more creative in your marketing endeavors. Yeah. Marketing is definitely um, kind of falls into that, that category where it's like, it's kind of like an art form, really hard to pin down to get down perfectly. It's, it's definitely different than buying like an actual good, like a forklift. That's very true, but yeah, um, Hey, influencer marketing is a wonderful thing. And it's, it's worked out pretty, really, really well for a lot of people. And yeah, yeah. Anyways, good job. Another Congratulations. thing I, I like about it is is you don't have to commit to it. You know, when you hire an advertising agency or something like that, it's they want a contract that says you're going to pay them 15 grand a month, uh, and and you know even if it's working or not working, they want their 15 grand a month. Yeah. This influencer yeah. marketing, it's you know it's 500 here, it's a thousand there, and you just keep paying the influencers. And if it's working, you keep paying them. If you don't, if it's not working, you don't have to pay them. So, um, it, it, it's it, it's a lot more, it, it's a lot better sort of cash wise and and. Um, and, and we're, we're having good results. Yeah, I would say uh, marketing now with, with the advent of the internet has became a lot easier and you can track KPIs a lot better now. That's Absolutely. one of the biggest things. Well, before, I mean, you would see multi-million dollar budgets go towards marketing with a lot of companies and then nothing would come out of it or at least nothing tangible. And now you can actually get down to track views, impressions, comments, and everything and, and kind of put a much better gauge on what you're actually getting for your money. But Anyways, Mike, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for giving us this intro to you. And we'll dive deep into the company next time. But for now, if anyone has any questions for Mike or anybody else on the team, let us know. We'll be happy to get an answer for you and stay tuned for more. Mike, have a wonderful day. Great. Thank you very much, Michael. Appreciate your time.